I'm sure you've done uh, more than enough listening. And as I'm a teacher, I'm going to start by setting you a problem and you can do some thinking. And this problem is set in the kind of world physicists love. So we're going to ignore air resistance. And yeah, it's a minor consideration. Imagine you're in a convertible and you're driving along a level road at a constant speed in your convertible and you have a ball in your hand. You throw the ball into the air. Where is the ball going to land? In front of the car? Behind the car? Or back into the car? And as well as thinking about that problem, I want you to think about how did you get to your answer on the problem? Whilst you're thinking about that, I'm going to tell you two stories from my time as a teacher. The first one happens on results day. And a student comes running up to me, shaking their result paper in the air, and they say, sir, sir, I got an A star. Outstanding, that's fantastic, I say. And they go, I know, and I don't understand physics at all. Don't have a clue about it. it doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. And I still don't know whether to be really impressed with that or slightly disheartened. The second story comes from a student a few years further up there, education, and they're the kind of student who's very diligent, very hardworking, and they come to me you know, quite upset and offended, and they say, look, sir, it's, it's just not fair. I'm working really hard. I'm doing everything you're telling me to do. I know all the facts, but I just don't get the questions. I come to an exam, and I don't get it. I don't understand any of it. It doesn't make any sense to me. Now, I think there's something interesting there about exams, the exam system and how we test students, but what I want to talk to you about today is I think there is more to becoming a successful student, more to expertise, than just acquiring facts. And I'll, we're going to think about what that extra bit of knowledge might be. And to do that, we're going to look at a thought experiment. And this is called the Chinese room experiment. And it was invented by the philosopher John Searle. Um, he was arguing about certain kinds of artificial intelligence, but I think this gives us some kind of insight into learning. So imagine we have a locked room, and we've locked a person into this room. And we're going to feed into the room questions written in Chinese characters. And to help the person locked inside the room, the person inside the room doesn't speak Chinese, but to help them out, we've given them a set of instructions and a set of pre-written Chinese characters, as you can see. And they're going to look at the instructions, and the instructions are going to say, well, if the character looks a bit like this, hand out character number 74. And they'll hand that character out of the room, and the question will be answered. Now, to the people outside the room, it might look like the person speaks fluent Chinese, that they understand Chinese. But to my mind, at least, the person inside the room has just followed a set of instructions. And I think the experience of schooling for both very able and less able students can be a bit like the experience of the person locked in the Chinese room. You follow instructions that seem a bit meaningless and arbitrary to you at times, but you get prizes if you do them well and you're told off if you do them wrongly. But it's this kind of strange, arbitrary game which you do where which you don't really have any buy into. And it's all a bit meaningless. And I want to think about what might be going on there. So there is more to learning, to learning successfully, than just acquiring facts and following procedures. And I want to propose that that extra something is tacit knowledge. And tacit knowledge is knowledge we can't articulate directly in words. Now, wanting to study tacit knowledge might seem like a really, really um, strange thing to want to do. Wanting to study knowledge that you can't articulate in words that's going to be a really bad idea for a PhD thesis, isn't it? <laughs> but I, I think we can get there. So let's have a look at what tacit knowledge might look like. We know um, experts will have a lot of explicit knowledge about a subject. That's why they're an expert. They will know lots of facts. But equally, we know experts know more than they can say in words. And that we call tacit knowledge. Students have much less conscious knowledge. That's why they're novices, that's why they're students. But a lot of research tells us that students arrive at subjects with implicit understandings, their tacit knowledge. But the tacit knowledge of experts is expert tacit knowledge, and that helps them to answer questions quickly and um, intuitively. And student tacit knowledge can be problematic. It can get in the way of learning more explicit knowledge later on. 
Now, I said studying tacit knowledge might seem like a crazy thing to do, but I think if I take an analogy from a subject I know well, physics, um, black holes are objects that don't emit a lot of radiation, hence why they're called black holes. But physicists have come to study them by their effects on surrounding matter. And I think we can get some handle on what's going on with tacit knowledge by looking at how this tacit knowledge affects conscious thinking. And there are two processes which let us do that. And these are intuition and insight. Intuitions are these feelings or hunches we have that you can't express directly in words. Insights are conscious themselves, this moment of sudden awareness, but they arrive without you consciously willing them. And I think both of these processes give us some sense of how tacit knowledge might influence your conscious thinking. So let's start by examining um, intuitions. And there are two bits of research that tell us about why we might have intuitions. The first is the idea of embodied cognition. And this is a research program in psychology. And it tells us thought is very much tied up with the body. So we don't hold just abstract concepts in our mind. Those concepts are tied up with kinesthetic and emotional data. So when I teach about the concept of force, yes, I have the explicit statements of Newton's laws in my mind, but equally some of it is tied up with sensory information I have through engaging with the physical world. And a lot of that is not directly teachable. The second area of research that might illuminate this is models of thinking that propose there are two processes by which we think. System one, which is fast and not directly conscious, and system two, which is slower and more deliberate. And it's proposed that thinking happens via the interaction of those two systems. For example, the um, psychologist Jonathan Haidt suggests that in moral thinking, actually what's going on is you have an emotional, intuitive response first. So you feel disgust or you feel happiness, and then you build a rational argument on top of that. But it's really um, the emotional, intuitive, tacit response that happens first. And he uses the analogy of saying the emotional dog causes the rational tail to wag. And I think this may explain some of the issues we have in schooling, that we often teach explicit rules for things. We teach how to structure an essay or how to structure an argument, but some of the reasons for doing that are partly tacit and are emotional and effective and cannot be taught just by telling rules of how to do this thing. The second um, process, which I think tells us something about tacit knowledge, are insights. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with some famous examples of insight. For example, Archimedes um, having thoughts about buoyancy and leaping out of the bath shouting Eureka, or Newton observing the apple and um, developing the theory of gravitation. And those may well be apocryphal. So I've got an example here which may, if you're lucky, allow you to experience a moment of insight right now. So this is the famous 10 coin problem. You need to move three of the coins to make the triangle point the other way. Anyone there? Moments of insight? No, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, being cruel to you. Psychologists point out that um, you need an incubation period. You need a period of time of uh, consciously or unconsciously thinking about a problem before you might reach a moment of insight. But you may have worked out that Uh, yeah, the, that's exactly what we're looking for, whoever had that. Well, I'm not sure it's quite the same if you have the moment of insight after you've been, been shown it, but um, I, won't take that, I won't take that excitement away from you. But I think th these insight moments are some of the most powerful moments we have in our learning and in teaching. And I think we can learn something from this problem. I think there are two kinds of problems fundamentally in schools. There are routine problems where you follow the same steps to get to the answer. And there are insight problems like this where you need this uh, discontinuity, this break away from a way of thinking about a problem. And you get this sudden solution. And those are also um, really important. Now at this point I want to make clear that I'm not arguing against factual knowledge. I'm not saying that factual knowledge is bad. Without factual knowledge, there can be no understanding. But what I am arguing is that factual knowledge on its own is impotent 
and has been likened to intellectual slavery. Let's go back to the, the car problem which we started with. I won't ask you for your thoughts, because actually what I think is, it's not so much the answer that's important, though I expect you're all dying to know the answer. It's how you got to your answer. The answer is the ball will fall back into the car. How did you get to your answer? And I think some of you will have had a gut instinct as to where the ball will go, without being able to rationally really argue where will the ball go, without being able to explain that. And that would be an intuition. If I'd given you more time to think about it, you may have had a sudden moment of clarity about it, an insight. But I think for a large number of you, tacit knowledge will have played a role in your thinking. And I think for all of us, there is a lesson to understand when are we using um, explicit thought, when are we relying on implicit ideas. And that's a powerful lesson um, for beyond school also. But to summarize, I think experts, at least some of their knowledge is tacit, our intuitions. And some of the processes they use to get to their knowledge, their insights, are also not fully conscious. How might we apply this, therefore, in schools? I'm going to make three cases for uh, ways we could change our education system to take uh, more account of tacit knowledge. Firstly, I think we need to set the right kind of problems in schools. Yes, routine problems are really important, when you're learning a new grammatical construction, when you are learning how to do algebra, you need to practice a skill again and again, and that's important. But lots of the most exciting and important problems in the real world don't work like that. We need to set uh, problems that allow students to experience moments of insight. So we need to set them problems that have these discontinuous breaks or have incomplete or changing information. The next thing I think is really important is we need to make students aware that tacit knowledge and tacit processing exists. So we need to tell students that often the first thought they have is not necessarily the best thought, that they should engage rational thinking after that. They should be aware that they have explicit and implicit ideas about a problem and learn to understand the interplay between those. And finally, um, I think we need to allow students to engage in appropriate stimuli so if you're learning um, a foreign language, you talk to native speakers. But what that's actually doing is allowing you to pick up really tacit and subtle ideas about intonation or pronunciation or usage that you couldn't actually teach directly. In science, we do practicals. And yeah, that's really important for learning certain practical skills, like you learn how to use a micrometer, or you learn how to use a microscope, and that's important. But actually, a lot of what practical is, practicals are about is gaining this library of resources about how the world works. You pick up these tacit pieces of understanding about how forces work, or how chemicals react, or about how organisms behave. You're building up your library of understanding of the world, and a lot of that is not explicitly teachable. We encourage students to read good prose, read well-written argument. And again, you're picking up subtle bits of knowledge about how we argue about how we make a case. And yes, we try and teach these things explicitly, and it's important for teachers to teach rules for doing these things explicitly, but you can't teach someone how to argue brilliantly um, entirely explicitly. It just doesn't work that way. Some of the knowledge is tacit. Schools are really good at transferring explicit knowledge, and we sell schools as being about acquiring explicit knowledge. But I think if we only sell that half of the diagram, we'll continue to see students like the ones I talked about in the introduction. Students who think, well, I've done all the explicit learning. I'm done. I should be good. I should be an expert. But that's not the way it works. If you think just learning the facts is going to make you really good at something, you're going to be disappointed and frustrated. So I think we really need to work on schools as places that foster tacit knowledge, places that make our students aware that they have both explicit and implicit ideas, and help them to tune their assumptions towards expertise.